and welcome to the Just New Book Summit. Oh my goodness, thank you, Suzanne. Um, you are an amazing, energetic person who is a valued voice um, and an inspiration. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here at your side. Thank you so much, and right back to you. That's really beautiful. So we've had, you know, multiple conversations about this. Our synergy is definitely there in alignment, and I love your offering and perspective. So we're going to talk all about that because it's a little unique to um, what we're doing here and to the summit. So I want you to hear this is so important. And I love when you say deaf literacy. I think that's so fantastic. I hope that one day, and I know it will happen, is that we are able to talk about deaf as equally, as uplifting, as embrace as we talk about life. So that, I think, encompasses your deaf literacy. But please, will you tell us all how you came to do this work? So um, I come out of branding, uh, marketing, uh, product development, uh, the, the foundation of which really is fashion business, the entertainment business, and again, as I said, product development. Um, it, when you're in product development, essentially what you're looking at is you're looking at what is the out-of-box experience. So you're always looking to delight your customer so they don't have what is called buyer's remorse. And when you're in the entertainment business, what you do is you essentially want to promise um, a good experience, and that's what fills the seat. And when you're in the fashion business, what you want to do is you want to um, give people an idea that they can be a particular image, what they aspire to be. So when you take all of this collective experience together, um, I had just finished up an engagement that happened to be uh, uh, around uh, at the Museum of Sex. And I was turning, you know, I was over 60, and I'm thinking, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, I really want to do something which has social impact and contributes back to the universe. Um, and so there I was, I was an aging individual. I had started to experience ageism in the marketplace, right, in the workplace. And I had all of this experience. And what I really wanted to do was to take it and look at what was an emerging trend or what was I experiencing because I'm part of the boomer cohort. And certainly, um, historically, the boomer cohort is the largest population, generational population that this country has ever seen, actually, it's unprecedented. And, and so I was looking at all of this data, and I'm thinking, when you synthesize it down, when you distill this down, uh, I kept coming across articles that spoke to the fact that um, this large population um, who was weaned on change, right? So civil rights, Woodstock, Watergate, all of that, now we're going to, we're approaching our older age, and we're going to mess with it because generationally that's our character. So how are we going to deal with aging, which kind of we were working on that quite well, but how are we going to deal with our death? And that's where the barrier, I hit a barrier, and I saw that um, what was being offered and what was being spoken about was really unattractive. Um, and it didn't um, give people an opportunity to consider, consider the experience. What was available was only um, the, the end, essentially. You live, and then suddenly you fall off the cliff. And when you age, you gain such wisdom, um, and it starts to resonate in a way where you tr I think you truly start to appre appreciate life as you've never done before. And so the idea of falling off a cliff is particularly unappealing. And then if you march it back a bit and you start to understand how we got here, it was very clear to me that we needed to redesign um, and, and reframe this aging into mortality and, uh, and, and understanding what impermanence really meant. So that's a, that's a long way of coming around to it how I got here, it was something I felt completely yeah. compelled to do to address um, and like that. Beautiful. So lots of things I want to highlight here. So number one is we have an aging population that we have never seen before in history. At this moment, Correct. not only 
and why the demographic needs of decades to come, and this is worldwide, by the way, not just the United States, we are not nearly set up to accommodate them on many levels, on all levels practically, but for myself speaking from a medical practitioner's point of view, being on the inside, I have been calling this what I call elder care crisis for years. Mm -hmm. You know, watching people fall through the cracks, cracks and have a very, um, very bad end of life and aging uh, processes, which mm -hmm. it needs to be. So I love the fact that you're taking the gifts that you give in your life and you're now turning them into something that will have a ripple effect, will have social change. And you mentioned the baby boomers. So let's talk about these incredible people for a minute. Yes, yeah. they rewrite the script and they rewrite mm -hmm. first. That's right. So they're going to rewrite the way that we do the end. And here's the thing, and I'll ask this question for you as a person. Is death a medical experience? Or is it a <laughs> So, but we forgot that. We have right. a couple. We literally outsource that elderly and that exercise to our medical practitioners, which, by the way, can't stand. Not only are they not trained in that holistic setting anymore, or haven't been in a while, but also they can't handle the amount of numbers per routine what happens mm -hmm. to you. you know, everything happens at once with COVID. This is the same thing. So we have to get ready. And it starts with the literacy of the conversation and death and options and what is life about. And because when you get to the end, it's a, it's a very important place. So that is incredibly beautiful. When you decided you were going to do this, and I know you're a smart lady because I've had the pleasure of getting to know you. And you put your packages together, you call them pictures. What was the biggest obstacle? What was the feedback that you were getting? And when did you start doing it? So I took a, a, after I finished my last engagement, I took a year off to really study uh, this, this subject matter, see who was out there, understand what the messaging was, and understand where the barriers to entry would be. I knew absolutely that um, I wanted to enter this not in a transactional way as one would expect where you develop a product and you sell it, right? I knew I want I knew that the best way to do this from all of the learning and my own sensitivity was that you you needed to create something that could iterate, right? So you put something out there, you see you test it, um, you see how people react and then you polish it one way or the other. Um, so you know, what really brought me to this point here, um, I'm thinking about a number of things, but what really brought me to this point here is that I've made uh, I don't know, thousands of creative pitches in my life uh, through business. And you can more or less read people's bodies, body language, right? And with uh, the reception that I got initially, it depending on who I spoke to was very clear as to where the barriers to entry were going to be. So when I first I started with my friends, right, um, and their reactions were, Karen, don't go there. I'm not good at discussing. And I'd say, just please, for me, um, let's just talk about this. Mm -hmm. And th then as we spoke about it, I could see the exhale. Mm -hmm. But but the entry point was very difficult for them. When I took it to the business universe, when I went to entrepreneurial settings and I said, I have this idea, um, can I get your support? Um, mo most people were in, they were just in lockdown. They were curled up, um, terribly afraid, told me essentially, um, don't go there. Wow. Um, yes. So they, they, didn't, they did not believe it was viable. It was really only until I went into the academic universe and the um, people who were practitioners in the end of life area that they recognized that the messaging and what I brought to the table would actually be of service to them. And I'm not talking about institutionalized healthcare, what I'm speaking about specifically are the doulas, the EOL practitioners, those who service people in their emotional place, less so their medicalized place. And why is this so important to have a conversation with every sector and every person because everyone is touched by this? Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So at the end of the day, I think that everyone can go back into their experiences and pull upon an end of life that they were part of, or heard about, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Although we have treated it like it's optional, um, you know, so we don't talk about 
why it won't happen, we know that that's not the case. We also know that there's so much benefit in planning ahead and having conversations mm -hmm. on multiple mm -hmm. levels. Mm -hmm. really great. But that's a learned experience, you have to understand. I did not know that, okay. so I'm on this learning curve, and I'm here deliberately. For people who are not on this learning curve, they crash into it at time of need. Of course. And that's the problem. Right, right. Yes, it adds about a thousand times suffering to the already difficult place that we're in, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so can you share again a, more, a little bit about the foundation of your work, what that looks like? And how sure. You and I love that you're doing this because I think there's so many different languages within undergrad, so it's so interesting. Yes. So, first of all, I come out of the creative mindset, and the creative mindset is all about risk. You have to take risk in order to um, find a proper, honest solution to a problem. You don't come in with a, a solution and then look for the problem, right? So, once, once you understand that you're going to be taking risk, and that more than likely you're going to be pivoting, and you're going to get to a place in which you think you have the right answer, and then you have to bring it to your essentially your audience and see is that the right answer? And you have to shade it, and you have to bring nuance to it, and sometimes you have to throw it out and start again. Um, so, in, in, in all of this, we have to find um, the approach. And so, revival. I created revival essentially as a gift wrap. Mm -hmm. Here's a conversation nobody wants to have. So how are you going to bring people in? I'm not asking for anything, right? This is the transaction is is just be patient enough to come and to hang out mm -hmm. and to listen to and read and participate in a conversation that has been curated, deliberately curated to not talk about what you don't want to see, not, to, okay. to avoid the ugly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And to give you a space to um, think about what is possible, right? Because if we're going to change the end of life experience, it has to be, a, people have to aspire to it. That's the ingredient, there's two ingredients to culture change, aspiration and time, right? I'm working on the aspiration because that's what I've done throughout my career is to create a visual, um, a response, a uh, sound, uh, to, uh, a story, to an aspiration. And people will come in, it's like, if you build it, will they come? Not in debt, they're not going to come unless you make it uh, pretty, in a way. You give them an opportunity to personalize it. Once, if, you're, if we're talking about personalizing at a funeral, that's not... Um, where I'm going, right? Uh, if you're talking about personalizing how you get there, in building the story, how you're creating, you're making meaning and you're finding purpose, you're learning how to become, um, to go through life, and death literacy is a process. It's not a one and done, you can't read a manual, right? This is an experience of being alive. It's a journey. Right? You're alive and you're including this. And it's not forbidden. It's, it's uncomfortable at the beginning because we don't have the culture. We don't have the permission in our culture to talk about this. But now, given the basically the collective consciousness, and, and this really took hold. I mean, it started, started to eke out in the early 2000s, right? But it really... I, and I came into this about 2015 when I started considering it. But something shifted 2017, 2018. It was a big shift. And now we are definitely in the culture change. It's a movement. Oh, yeah. Right? It's a global one. And it is a beautiful one. So you said the inspiring time. Tell me about the time to you. Well, the time, the time you just have to be here, right? But as I said, the, the conversation about, uh-oh, something's coming, uh-oh, there's 76 million boomers, uh-oh, right behind them are the millennials and the, the Gen Xs. These are three successive generations that are crashing into their collective oldness. 
the healthcare system knew this was going to happen. They were started talking about it. The economists started talking about it a long time ago. The academics, but you know, they were just like flailing and waving their hands. But what happened was we had to arrive there where it was truly starting to impact the system. And the system started to crack, and it was like, oh yeah, we got a problem. Yeah. Well, the other thing that's a big issue is that um, we get one opportunity to do end of life stuff there. We don't get to go back and do it again. We can't, we can't redo that. And families yeah. have been in a lot of pain from this enormous of this not system. And right. when we came out with other solutions for them, when we said, again, again, I'm a nurse. I went to my medical institution first, right? That would make the most sense. So, hey, I have these ideas, training, we can do more support. And they were like, it's so great, we just can't do it. And I said, hi, we won't get reimbursed for it. We don't have the staff for it. Okay, I got you. So, you know what? We're going to create that space. We're going to create a non medical profession to support mainstream medical yet again. And just like, in all, in my opinion, all healthcare is to be holistic and exclusive. But also, end of life is a non medical presuming experience. You can all work together and have this great outcome, hopefully. So, I love that so much. And let's talk about the city. I think if you were saying you want to make it pretty, there is so much beauty in aging, and there is so much beauty in end of life. If it goes well, it's really part of it. And I think that because we have got so far removed as a society, globally, fearing death, that people are not privileged to have seen that part of it. So we don't know the truth. So when we start to share stories, when we start, start to share how it can go down, um, and it really does open up people. Listening to wisdom from those at the end of life is one of the most incredible places you can be at because for me, there's no more of a truth coming than somebody who's getting ready to lose and imparting wisdom or whatever they're experiencing. Um, so when you say that we want to make that a, a different ID with you is that we have to start sharing the positive, the stories, um, and they have been absolutely incredible ones. So let me let me ask you this and correct me if I'm wrong. Be Vital is a platform for deaf literacy with different initiatives in it, and they keep right. going up. So I love it. I love it so much. That's great. And I think part of what you said is very similar to Be Resilient International. It's like we put together a lot of different things put them together, give them to what I call the universe, the public to see, and then if they take off, they do. If they're embraced, they do. Okay. And then we have lots of different ways that we approach this beautiful thing called death and life. Yeah. Yes. That's yes. So the arc. So we have, we're talking about the story arc, right? So life is measured in three acts. Beginning, middle, and end. We neglect, we, we have neglected the end. We have terrorized the end, actually. I'm going to give you a little anecdote that I came across that you might find interesting. The, you know, we talk about, um, you know, how the funeral business started, actually, right? And we roll, roll back the calendar 200 years. And, and really with the industrialization of our country, when we started moving away from the country doctor, um, and when people got sick and they started to go to hospitals or medical centers, right? And then the dying, once you got sick and it was clear that you were going to die, you were you were you died in the hospital. Okay? And then the doctor, the attending doctor, physician, they would pull the white curtain. Now think about that. The pulling of the white curtain is symbolic between what is clean and what is unclean. And that's really the visual that has been embraced all along and since then about don't go there because it's unwashed it is unsanitary it's not clean it has germs and so we have developed this phobia you know and it was it's an existential crisis about this that we cannot um really understand we haven't embraced as a modern society um the life cycle you know the storytelling and that's what the bible is all about the bible is is creating different initiatives to tell the same story. It's other people's story and it's your story. And it's your opportunity. You have an opportunity now as a consumer to purchase um, a, a legacy, right? And then you're going to give away your stuff to a generation that probably doesn't want it because that doesn't represent them. Or you can opt into having a 
legacy, which is emotionally robust. And if you take care of your story and you take the time to understand the, the arc of life and um, what you want to leave behind, yeah. the most powerful thing that you can do is leave a story that is robust and it has, um, it, it continues, right? It's a life lesson that continues and you won't be forgotten. You know, people are so worried about their legacy. The legacy is the relationship in life. Yes, and it's also a very organic important piece to a positive end of life is that coming to acceptance of what your journey does. And I feel like this is, again, being ahead of the curve. It also gives us, us an opportunity to say, wait a minute, am I, am I done? Like, you know, if I was to sit here now, what is it that's going to be that important for me that I would want to read that has me really evaluating my time uh, and how I'm spending it? Because, you know, we know that, yes, one day it will happen. So I love this on so many levels, but it's very important we do legacy work or life reviews with, with patients. If we can, if we have enough time and it's able to go there, that completion of that is so important and pivotal to those really beautiful end of life that we see that they go ahead and find the value that they have. They understand the life lessons and, and sometimes we're sharing them. So I love that so much. I think it's beautiful. Um, with that, what are the most important lessons that you learned from your mentor? Well, the first thing that happened was is that everything became electrified. I just like everything became hot. My life turned into high death, which which was absolutely delicious. You know, you think you're living, and then all of a sudden, the, everything turns up very brightly. So that's a that's a wonderful thing. So what do we need? What do we need uh, and what do we want and what are the lessons here? So one, yeah, you better have an exit strategy. That's what, that's what best literacy is. It's, it's not going to be easy, but, but persevere. Have a conversation, have another conversation, have another conversation. Just keep breaking through the resistance because that is a gift that you're giving yourself, but more so you're giving others. You're, 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 Helping people change and abandon, or it's kind of like a cocoon coming out of their, you know, their shell. Um, that you get to abandon things that haven't been examined. Right? They're unconscious biases. So, yes, have an exit strategy. Practice death cleaning. You know what does that mean? Uh, start getting rid of your stuff. Get away. And, <laughs> you know, pare your life down. It's so free. I mean, the oxygen so, just sweeps in. Oh my god! And how do you collect all that stuff? And I'm a minimalist, honestly. And I feel like, oh, I gotta, you know, every so often I just, I love that. Uh, yeah, great. Yeah. You know, then there's the obvious: eat well, or, you know, exercise, exercise your body and your mind. Make that um, you know, give of yourself, socialize, be generous. Learn compassion. I gotta tell you that it wasn't, regardless of who I was before, it was my relationship and my introduction into the dual universe, the cohort, that truly taught me compassion. I mean, I see this and I was just aghast at how the doulas have this capacity to love. And to bring, uh, to hold space for others, for strangers, you know, to straddle the delta between life and death, to, to help people um, comfortably as much as possible. And again, it keeps coming down to emotion, to comfortably move out of one phase into another phase. And for those who are left behind, they, they're not left damaged. The way it happens, you know, unfortunately, in the medicalized universe, people are just, it's so frantic and it's, it's so unfortunate. People are not prepared. They come in unprepared and they leave. And who, leave, who gets to walk out is still unprepared. And that is an unfortunate remedy for living the rest of one's life. I mean, remedy is the wrong word. It's a catastrophe, actually. So, you know, and, and in 
all of the work that we're doing in the events, um, because now we've really focused on where how the message gets out. And, yeah. and what, what we've discovered, the most potent way to put out the message is through something we call edutainment, uh, education, and entertain. You know, people are going to come, you're going you're to make them feel good, and plus you're going to give them a little nugget of something to go home and consider. And that little nugget is going to help alter and shift their perspective. That's the goal, right? Yeah. And then they're willing to become definite with and that's where the aspiration kicks in. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we do that. We do edutainment events. We do the celebrating aging of film, which Absolutely. yeah, you know, that's you know. Good ways to approach this beautiful thing. And you know, we say definite, it's the right word. You know, they they're not they're that's right. they're not separate from one another. I want to highlight a couple of things you just said is that um, the end of life experience is videotaped and ingrained in us. If it does not go well, you remember that forever. So family right. not with this weight on them, sometimes tragically forever in such pain when it doesn't go well. And when it does go well, you remember that forever. So there are families that I have been, again, the one to be at the door, as soon as that person died, as a nurse, and they have opened the door they're sad that this person has an end of life, but a few of them have said, you have to hear how this went. Like, exciting. And that's so incredible that that is attainable, um, because they remember that forever. And the second thing you said is about the years, and I really want to share this. This has been one of the most magnificent areas to see expand, and the people in it are so incredible who are doing this work. And it's really, again, in my opinion, getting back to what we call universal cause. And the fact that these are very basic and very beautiful. Oneness, right? Everyone's mm -hmm. the one. No judgment. Meeting people where they are. Having compassion and presence. Mm -hmm. If we incorporate these universal laws once again into our world, what a magnificent place that we can live in. And I hope to be seeing that happen. So I love that you said that, yes, they are just incredible uh, people doing this work, and they they have a ripple effect. So that yeah. endless life and that compassion has an uh, ongoing life, which is beautiful. I love that term. Okay. Um, what do you hope to accomplish in the next five years of this? Where do where you see? Where would you like to be in five years? If you could say. Well, first of all, obviously to expand um, what we're doing and to have it um, take a you know, Create deeper roots with people. Um, certainly, part of what you know, my conversation here is. I just finished the, just doing a series on doulas podcast with doulas. Mm -hmm. um, we'll publish one, I think, next week. We have one ready to publish, um, and we will continue to do that. Um, I know you're aware of one of the, the one of the projects, my my pet project, which was a photographic essay mm -hmm. uh, with doulas. And um, that's getting out there, and I've been contacted. Well, actually, I was contacted by a group in Australia um, that they would like to repeat that. They understand the um, perception reality part of this is when you bring the doula universe to the, to the population. And anytime I speak and I talk about um, doulas, uh, they're like, how do I do that? Where do I find them? Talk more. Can you make a recommendation? Because they understand the value of this cohort and what they're bringing to the experience. So yes, developing more projects like that, um, which um, impart a sense of beauty and bring the emotional component into it, so people do have the ability to have um, what they consider completion. Yeah, and what um, I love is you're giving so many different options for people to be able to engage in this topic. Um, you know, it, it's wonderful because the, people will gravitate towards certain different things, and again, it all leads to the same pathway, which is wonderful. What do you, in your opinion, what do you think that deaf awareness can do to raise up our humanity? If we <laughs> all accept deaf being a part of our journey one day, yes, what do you think that would actually do for raising up our humanity? Raising up our humanity? It, well, I don't think it'll it will eliminate evil. But it'll certainly dampen its power. 
um, with the subtext, right? Because when you get to the place, listen, when you arrive at the awareness that uh, we are very, we're on a time um, conveyor belt, let's say, right? Yeah, okay. That uh, wasting time on, on irrelevant, um, it becomes less important, right? So the focus is what is deaf awareness going to do? It might, it, hopefully, it will make us a kinder, gentler species, right? Yeah. Um, and it will, it will give us the ability to understand how to project a future, a healthy future, and a future that exists, um, rather than a future that just doesn't exist. Um, like that, we're not a video game. Yeah, this is not something that you can plug and play and then quit and come back to. Right. I love it so much. I, I agree with that, and I believe that that will do it. It also, you know, you helps us all in this thing together called life. Um, and one of our legacies could be like, how how are we leaving this planet for the next generation? What did I do to contribute? That's right. That's that's that is the key to to one's legacy. I mean, what I'm doing now, whether or not. My kids, my young adult children understand, truly understand uh, what I'm doing. I would like them to, but it almost doesn't matter. Because when I'm gone, I have left something of substance for them. Now, if they continue that, um, but the ripple effect of that will be pretty significant. Even Because all it takes, deaf literacy, is one person at a time. All you have to do is influence one person for change, yeah. and then they in turn take that message and move it forward. So it is a collection of change. It is a collection of decisions that foster change. And culture, culture change takes a while. So if I see it in my lifetime, I'd be really, really happy. I hope so. But the change has already started. Oh, you're seeing it. Right? We're just, we're, and we're a piece of the pie. Yeah. We're, we're one morsel. We're one little piece, uh, you know, molecule. And that's just fine. Yeah. Well, you just, the whole thing about my philosophy on life is that we're all connected and we're just one little piece of this one unit, but we're all part of the unit. Right. So, Karen Martino, you are so wonderful, and I love your contribution to this movement and what you do and i can't wait to continue to share your work so how can people find out more about you well thank you for asking so survival.com survival is you know, essentially it's being and revival it was a word way back when and then it was and then it became we became used to the word revival but it's revival.com um e2kd which is dying to know day is an annual event it was founded, actually created by an organization in Australia called the Groundswell Project, who's doing fabulous work over there. Um, and Dying to Know Day essentially is a learning event in August. It's an annual event. Um, and if we come to town to either the Celebrating Aging in Film series, or now we have the Mixed Reality Theater uh, online, which we've been piloting and workshopping. And now we're going, to, we're going to be rolling it out in a couple of communities. Um, it's fabulous. And it's, again, it's covering all of the topics we need to learn about um, like that. So, yes, go to the website first and foremost. Go online. We're on Facebook. Uh, Survival.inspires on Instagram. So just you could support us by following us and spreading the message. Love it, and we'll be posting all your events as well because we believe in you so much. So again, I want to just thank you so much for being part of this summit, and you have again been such a gift to the movement. And I appreciate it so much. Oh, um, you're a force to be reckoned with, and I am delighted to support everything that you do. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, this was the Jeff Stevens Global Summit. Thank you so much for being here, and I will see you in the next. Thanks, everybody.